This episode will discuss sensitive and potential triggering topics, including violence, abuse, and trauma, and will contain details and descriptions of crimes and events that some listeners may find offensive, disturbing, and or distressing. This episode may not be appropriate for younger audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hola, my beautiful humans. This is Jasmine Castillo. And this is Josue Hernandez. And I bring stories and cases from the people of color community, bringing awareness of murdered and missing indigenous women, girls, two spirits, the LGBTQ community, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Black indigenous people of color. These are their stories. So welcome to Hands Off, my podcast. Part 1. Reclaiming Our History Although it is no longer July, we can still bring awareness to Black, Indigenous, People of Color mental health. The Running Bear Studies, funded by the National Institutes of Health, or NIH, are the first medical studies to systematically and quantitatively examine the relationships between American Indian boarding school, child attendance, and physical health status which correlates to the mental health of children and families that had endured these boarding schools. Indian boarding school child attendees had a 44% greater count of past year chronic physical health problems, or the PYC, PHP, as adults compared to adults non-attendees. Now adult attendees were more likely to have medical problems such as cancer, tuberculosis, diabetes, and arthritis. Previous research has noted that indigenous men experience more physical and sexual abuse in boarding school than women, particularly those more, quote-unquote, language experienced. The increased trauma that men faced in the Indian boarding school system may have produced increased stress, which then may affect the biological systems of the body. These stressors may then introduce epigenetic alterations, also known as epigenetic inheritance that are then transferred to their children. So what is being done? The Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative investigation includes identifying the location of marked and unmarked burial sites across the Federal Indian Boarding School system, which may later be used to assist in locating unidentified remains of indigenous, Native American, and Native Hawaiian children. Outside the scope of the investigation, the department also identified over a thousand other federal and non-federal institutions, including Indian day schools, sanitariums, asylums, orphanages, and standalone dormitories. For nearly two centuries, the United States pursued, embraced, and permitted a policy of forced assimilation of Native Americans, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian people. The federal Indian boarding school system was developed to target indigenous children to accomplish this policy objective for over 150 years and influence U.S. Indian relations and U.S. Native Hawaiian relations. The department must fully account for it in this effort to renounce forced assimilation of indigenous tribes, Alaska Native villages, and Native Hawaiian community as a legitimate policy objective. To begin this process of healing from the harm and violence caused by assimilation policy, the department should affirm and express policy of cultural revitalization by supporting the work of indigenous tribes, Alaska Native villages, and the Native Hawaiian community to revitalize their languages, cultural practices, and traditional food systems, and by protecting and helping to strengthen intra-tribal relations. Three indigenous organizations in BC will receive a total of $1.5 million from the province to enhance counseling services for victims of residential schools and their families. Indigenous leaders and scholars say a provincial government announced that it will allocate $1.5 million to these three projects that offer mental health support to those affected by residential schools. Quote, The announcement, which is part of what was already announced last June, is a drop in the bucket, end quote, said Terry Tigui, the elected regional chief of the B.C. Assembly of First Nations. 
One of the three indigenous organizations in BC are called Indian Residential School Survivors Society. The executive director, Angela White, said that the organization will use $750,000 it will receive to keep its 24-7 cultural support line going. White mentioned that, quote, people who have called the cultural support line have told us they are happy to have a place where they feel safe, where they know that the person on the other end of the phone is indigenous and they understand where they are coming from, end quote. Prior to Columbus's arrival in the Americas in 1492, the area boasted thriving indigenous populations totally more than 60 million people. A little over a century later, that number had dropped close to 6 million. Shortly after that, their numbers began to fall rapidly due to war and diseases brought by settlers. Native Americans faced centuries of persecution and discrimination losing their land and resources and being forced onto reservations that lacked the soil and natural resources needed to build and sustain the communities. The Doctrine of Discovery of 1493 provided a framework for Christian explorers to lay claim to territories uninhabited by Christians. If the lands were vacant, then it could be defined as quote-unquote discovered and sovereignty claimed. Approximately 300 years later, it was July 13, 1787, and a Northwest Ordinance had just been passed. This document encompassed many things, including the equal representation of new states, the prohibition of slavery, and about halfway down the second page, it states, quote, The utmost good faith shall always be observed towards the Native Americans. Their lands and property shall never be taken from them without their consent and in their property, rights and liberties, they never shall be invaded or disturbed unless in just and lawful war is authorized by Congress. But laws found in justice and humanity shall from time to time be made for preventing wrongs being done to them and for preserving peace and friendship with them." End quote. These optimistic feelings that were expressed towards the Native Americans and this need to protect them would only last so long. A hundred years later, the Dawes Act was put into place. This policy focused specifically on breaking up reservations and tribal lands by granting land allotments to individual Native Americans and encouraging them to take up agriculture. It was reasoned that it, if a person adopted quote-unquote white clothing and ways and was responsible for their own farm, they would gradually lose their quote-unquote Indianness and be assimilated into European culture. By 1900, the Indians had lost 60 million acres of reservation land. In the middle of that, quote, from 1783 to 1830, American Indian policy reflected the new American nation's state desire to establish its own legitimacy and authority by controlling Native American peoples and establishing orderly, prosperous white settlements in the continental interior, end quote. Continuing on to 1863, where the Emancipation Proclamation broadened the goals of the Union war effort. It made the eradication of slavery into an explicit Union goal. In addition to the reuniting of the country, it also prevented European forces from intervening in the war on behalf of the Confederacy. Perhaps the most impacting one, the Indian Act, passed by Canada in 1876, attempted to generalize a vast and varied population of people and assimilate them into non-indigenous society. It forbade First Nations peoples and communities from expressing their identities through governance and culture. They did this best by implementing the residential school system. The effect the residential school has had on the indigenous people can be psychologically compared to the Stanford Prison Experiment. This famous experiment entailed college students who volunteered after seeing an ad in a newspaper first being examined to ensure that they were healthy enough to deal with whatever extremities were to be dealt with. Once that was done, some of the subjects were arrested and taken from their homes and then to prison by real law enforcement and convicted of crimes they did not commit. Once in prison, there were other college volunteers posing as prison guards and they were informed that the prisoners were all terrible people who had done atrocious things. Given only that information, 
the security guards were allowed to treat the prisoners in any way they deemed fit, so long as no physical harm was done. This experiment got so out of hand that it had to be stopped after six days, despite it being intended to last two weeks. Also being snatched from their homes were indigenous children. The Stanford Prison Experiment was designed to study the effect of social roles and it was intended to quote, create an atmosphere of oppression. In the experiment, the prisoners wore dress like attire and ankle bracelets to signify their inferiority. Indigenous children had longer hair, darker skin, and spoke a different language. And, being so young, most likely had not committed any crimes. So why is it that they were treated so badly in residential schools? After reading about residential schools, it is clear that oppression was a main focus and the main reason for the mistreatment of these indigenous children. All Native American tradition, whether it be clothing, religion, or language, was seen as inferior to Christians. These elements of inferiority birthed an atmosphere of oppression on its own, and this natural establishment of social roles paved the dangerous road that would later traumatize approximately 150,000 Native American children, with thousands of them losing their lives in the process. A quote from the official site for Parks Canada states that residential schools were, quote, founded on notions of racial, cultural, and spiritual superiority, and attempted to convert indigenous children to Christianity and separate them from their traditional cultures, end quote. While this time in history was terrible and the damage that has been done to the indigenous people by Christians is beyond repair, it may be beneficial to consider how it came to be psychologically in order to prevent any future cultural conflicts. Native Americans were painted in a dark light, and after the Native American Wars, they were seen as an enemy to many and an ally to few. They were different in many ways and were known to be hostile in many ways, and, just like any other time in history when the enemy looked different or had different values, whether it was the Greeks and the Romans, Americans and the British, or the US and the Vietnamese, there was a need to eliminate the threat. But this fight wasn't fair by any means. Native American culture was sought out to be removed from the face of the earth, and the plan was simple. Take children from their homes and change their ways by punishing them for doing anything that represents their culture. This was an extreme and immoral form of assimilation that should have never been condoned. And moving on to the problem of Indian administration, the Merriam Report of 1928 was called the most important treatise on Indian affairs since Helen Hunt Jackson's book, A Century of Dishonor, 1881. The idea of commissioning a study of Indian administration began in 1913 when Acting Commissioner of Indian Affairs Frederick H. Abbott suggested to the Board of Indian Commissioners that the government seek advice on how to make the Indian office more efficient. Scholars disagreed over whether or not the Merriam Report was a harbinger of the Indian New Deal. Some regarded it as a precursor of the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934. Margaret Sass, researcher and writer in the American Indian and the Comparative and Indigenous History, called it, quote, the symbol of a definitive response to the failure of 50 years of assimilation policy, end quote. But Donald Critchlow, historian and professor of American political history, claimed that the Merriam and his associates were efficiency experts and that their recommendations contrasted sharply with the radical program of John Courier and the American Indian Defense Association, AIDA. The American Indian Defense Association of 1923 wanted to end individual ownership of land and to move toward tribal ownership by restoring allotments to the reservations from which they had been drawn. Rather than call for an end to allotments, the Merriam Report said allotments should be made with extreme conservatism. Historically, residential schools can be compared to the Holocaust. Obviously, the number of victims is dramatically lower, but the inhumane, unspeakable acts were similar in both the Holocaust and the Canadian Holocaust. In both of these terrible times in history, difference in religion, dehumanization, and discipline at its worst was prevalent. We, as North Americans, so passionately pushed to end Hitler's reign from September 1st, 1939 to May 7th, 1945. But it wasn't until more than 50 years later that we could finally see the hypocrisy of our actions. Just as the Nazis tortured and murdered the Jewish people of Germany because of the differences, we continued to do the same with indigenous children, but we didn't see any wrongdoing in our ways. The Indian Civil Rights Act of 1969 ended segregation, integrated schools, and prohibited discrimination in the realms of employment, housing, voting, and many more. 
The movement was largely nonviolent and involved acts of civil disobedience such as boycotts, marches, and sit-ins. This paved the way to the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act to be fully taken advantage of. This declared that the Congress recognizes a full federal obligation to be responsive to the principle of self-determination through Indian involvement, participation, and direction of education and service programs. The Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement of 2006 was the final settlement agreement among Canada. Plaintiffs, as represented by the National Consortium, Merchant Law Group, and other legal counsel, the Assembly of First Nations, Inuit representatives, the General Synod of the Anglican Church of Canada, the Presbyterian Church in Canada, the United Church of Canada, and Roman Catholic entities and its recitals and schedules as amended, supplemented or restated from time to time. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission 2015 was created to investigate gross human rights violations that were perpetrated during the period of the apartheid regime from 1960 to 1994, including abductions, killings, and torture. Not only were there boarding school survivors, there was also day scholars, which aren't usually recognized. Day scholars are individuals who attended a federally owned and operated residential school during the day but returned home at night. They suffered many of the same grave harms and abuses as other students at residential schools, including the loss of language and culture. The Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, IRSSA, is an agreement between the Government of Canada and approximately 86,000 Indigenous people in Canada who at some point were enrolled as children in the Canadian Indian Residential School System, a system that was in place from 1879 to 1997. It has formally recognized 139 residential schools across Canada. This number excludes schools that operate without federal support. By the 1930s, about 30% of Indigenous people were believed to be attending residential schools. The number of school-related deaths remains unknown due to incomplete records, Estimates range from 3,200 to over 30,000. The indigenous youth were treated as animals, being sexually sterilized, inoculated with smallpox, thousands eventually dying, and even fed small portions of food, sometimes at the point of starvation, just to test the limits of the human body. These are children we are talking about, being used as lab rats, disposable and rid of free will. The last school to close was Kivalik Hall in Rankin Inlet, in what's now Nunavut, which closed in 1997. It became an IRSSA-recognized school in 2019, following a court ruling, which is why earlier accounts described the last school closing in 1996. This school closed following these events. Red Power, affiliated with the American Native American Movement, AIM, insisted on the abolishment of the Native American Act in 1978. A lawsuit in 1989 by Nora Bernard, a residential school survivor from New Brunswick who was later murdered in December of 2007. Press coverage after 14-year-old Native American girl Maisie Shaw was murdered at the Alberni Residential School on December 18, 1995. Followed closely by another murder made public on December 20, 1995, this time Albert Gray from Ahousit being the victim. Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, refused to further investigate on account of both murders. Starting in 1996 and continuing until 1998, after being expelled, Reverend Kevin Annett publicly discloses hundreds of criminal files linked to Native American residential schools, finally giving the public a glimpse at the multitude of children being mistreated and proving that the recent murders are not rare and never have been. But that poses the question, would they have completely ended the IRSSA had they not been outed? It may be as dumb as asking if a thief would stop stealing if they haven't been caught. Even though there was a trend indicating that all residential schools would have eventually been closed, who knows if they would have? had there not been a proverbial sequence of dominoes that would eventually knock down the walls to expose these residential schools for what they really were. From the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative investigative report completed in May of 2022, The business research also identified that there were Indian boarding schools that accepted at-risk whites, Hispanics, and African Americans. After President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, which ended the Civil War in 1865, 
African American children, also called quote unquote freedmen, refer to the Indian boarding school system. The department acknowledges that other schools had combined enrollments of these children who also attended the school un until it closed in the 1970s. The Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative investigation demonstrates that missionaries, the Kingdom of Hawaii, now Hawaii, and individual Native Hawaiian monarchs and royalty established boarding schools to educate Native Hawaiian children, including for assimilation and retention of culture. Some boarding schools operated throughout the Kingdom of Hawaii, Republic of Hawaii, Territory of Hawaii, and the States of Hawaii. The investigation shows that from 1819 to 1969, the United States supported approximately seven federally operated or supported Indian boarding schools in Hawaii. This investigation also reports details that the department operated or supported 408 federal Indian boarding schools across 37 states. Previously considered territories, including 21 schools in Alaska and 7 schools in Hawaii. Given that an individual federal Indian boarding school may account for multiple sites, the 408 federal Indian boarding schools comprise of 431 specific sites. Canada forced an estimated 150,000 First Nation, Métis, and Inuit children to attend residential schools for over a century, and the Catholic Church ran about 60% of the institutions. The last residential school closed in 1996. Their children were removed from their homes like hostages. Many children disappeared while enrolled in boarding schools. Many others were beaten and abused psychologically, changing them forever from the children their families once knew. Bud White Eye is a residential school survivor who recalls when he was seven years old being taken while in an Indian reserve at Raventown as he was walking down the road with four of the children. They were on their way to his grandmother's house in July of 1955 when a black car pulled alongside them. The driver offered a ride to which they refused. The children kept walking but yet the black car kept following them. The driver offered again and took them to a restaurant to give them ice cream and jello. After they finished ice cream, they loaded them back into the car. It headed in the opposite direction, away from the reservation. Bud remembers falling asleep and waking up in front of the Mohawk Institute. As he got older, he came to the realization that he was kidnapped. Not even his own parents knew where he was. Children were punished for speaking their languages and practicing their culture. They were separated from their families and, in many cases, were subjected to physiological, physical, and sexual abuse. Similar to Bud's story is Irene Fable, a woman who was taken into a residential school between 1941 and 1949, described in a CBC interview on July 8, 2008, how she witnessed the murder of a baby by staff at the Muscoequan Indian Residential School, which was ran by the Roman Catholic Church in Lestock, Saskatchewan. Irene made this statement in 2008. There was a young girl. She was seven years old, and she was pregnant. And what they did, she had her baby, and they took the baby and wrapped it up in a nice pink outfit, and they took it downstairs where I was cooking dinner with the nun. And they took the baby into the furnace room, and they threw that little baby in there and burned it alive. All you could hear was this little crying, and that was it. Irene recalls how you could smell that flesh cooking. This segment of the interview is no longer available on the CBC archives. Systematic Identity Alteration Methodologies Employed by federal Indian boarding schools included renaming indigenous children from indigenous names to different English names, cutting the hair of indigenous children, and requiring the use of military or other standard uniforms as clothes. Jim LaBelle recalls being tagged with a yellow card and tethered by a rope in a line with his brother and other children. When they arrived at their destination, their possessions were taken, they were stripped naked, their heads were shaved, and they were washed with harsh brushes. They were given numbers instead of names, and the numbers were sewn into their new clothing. LaBelle was eight years old, and his brother, Kermit, was six. Other children were as young as five. Indian boarding school rules were often enforced through punishment, including corporal punishment, such as solitary confinement, flogging, withholding food, whipping, slapping, or cuffing. At times, rule enforcement was a group experience. LaBelle said students were beaten and locked in cupboards. One sadistic male staffer beat LaBelle's friend so savagely he broke his jaw. 
without consequences. LaBelle recalls being stripped with another boy and spraying with frigid, high-pressure water. Initial analysis demonstrates a trend of indigenous children escaping and running away from federal Indian boarding schools. Quote, The children who have run away from school have been promptly brought back and punished. And judicious punishment has, in all instances, proved very salutary. Another story. Gordon Beardy, 71, now chief of Muskrat Dam, Lake First Nation, was forced along with three of his friends to attend Cecilia Jeffrey Indian Residential School in Kenora, the school he ran away from in the spring of 1962. The boys hid during the day and walked at night, but when he grew tired and collapsed from exhaustion, he got separated from his friends. Alone, Beardy waited in a dark corner of the train station and read it, planning to hop on the next train regardless of where it was going. This school became notorious when another boy, Cheney Wenjack, died while trying to run away in 1966. Native children had no role models and learned no parenting skills. The children were set up to be completely dependent on a system, and history was taught with implicit bias, as it still is in schools today. The current total population of Native Americans in the United States is 6.8 million, which is less than 2% of the entire population. There are about 574 federally recognized Native American tribes in the U.S. Today, Native Americans still face threats from federal and state governments related to land use and resource extraction. Native Americans have the highest poverty rate of any major racial group, which is one in four people living below the poverty line. History shows Native Americans being treated as lesser. They are anything but that. When it comes to the indigenous people, their willingness to fight for what they believe in is unparalleled. As of 2010, the Department of Defense reported 1.7% of the military being Native American, despite only 1.4% of the United States being indigenous, giving them the highest per capita involvement of any racial group in the United States. The amount of Native American involvement in earlier wars is not specifically known, but they have had documented involvement in the following wars. The American Revolution. There were an estimated 20,000 Iroquois during the 1600s. Only 8,000 remained after the war. The U.S. Civil War. Less than 3,600 served in the Union Army. World War I. Despite not even being considered U.S. citizens, 12,000 served and four received the Croix de Guerre Medal from France for displaying acts of heroism. World War II. More than 44,000, with 99% of eligible Native Americans ages 21 to 44 enlisting. The Korean War. 10,000 served and three were awarded the Medal of Honor out of the total 146 awarded. The Vietnam War. 42,000 served, 90% volunteering. And many more wars. We would like to thank all veterans and active military for your service. We appreciate all that you have done for this country and all the sacrifices that you have made to ensure our freedom. Pope Francis was visiting Canada between July 25th and 29, 2022, starting in Alberta and ending in Nunavut, to address the devastating legacy of Canada's residential school system. On Monday, July 25th, the Pope gave a formal apology for the abuses of residential schools. Quote, I humbly beg forgiveness for the evil committed by so many Christians against the indigenous peoples. End quote. The Pope's upcoming visit to Canada brings mixed emotions among many indigenous people. Some residential school survivors and those living with intergenerational trauma the institutions caused are ready to forgive the Roman Catholic Church for the brutality it inflicted on indigenous peoples. For others, the ongoing pain makes it hard to let go of the anger. He failed to address a couple of other issues like the doctrine and discovery and the genocide of thousands of children that died in these residential schools. Pope Francis was there to meet the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call, the Action Number 58, in Canada. However, his apology fell extremely short due to a lacking talks of the Catholic Church and its contribution to the genocide of Indigenous children. These families need to know the truth of numbers of children that died, who they are, who their families are, that's really important part of healing by telling the truth and acknowledging the truth from the Catholic. It's not an indigenous problem. This is a colonial issue. <laughs> 
Thank you for listening to Hands Off My Podcast. If you are enjoying the podcast and you'd like to support the mission, I do have a Patreon membership that will help the cause and bring more detail on cases and stories from the people of color community. If you yourself has a lost loved one or a story suggestion, please don't hesitate to contact me at email. Hands off my podcast at gmail.com. And if you are only able to support in another way, please give this podcast a five star rating on Apple or Spotify and continue to listen to upcoming episodes every Thursday, wherever you listen to your podcast. Dios te bendiga.